Okay, uh, so everyone, this is Finance Meets Real Estate. We meet here every Tuesday, uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, as uh, you guys know, like most of you, uh, we are a live webinar that gets posted to YouTube. So make sure to check our YouTube channel, Finance Meets Real Estate on YouTube. And this uh, webinar is going to be posted there as well. We have an amazing guest here today. It's uh, Alessandra Thompson. So uh, she's a... Uh, 26, 26 year old real estate investor. So she's based in Nashville, Tennessee currently. Uh, she works uh, for Yerusi Holdings and she does her personal real estate syndications as well. Um, so she has, um, well, so she has two properties under management and she also handles asset management and operations for Yerusi Holdings. So she's gonna talk about uh, ways to maximize NOI with great asset management. So, um, yeah, so not to, to go too long on the bio, I'm gonna pass it on to Alessandra. And so if you guys have any questions, feel free to speak up. We're doing an open format or you can put them on the chat and I will ask my questions as well. So with that, uh, Alessandra, the, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for having me on. It's uh, mm. always exciting to be on a webinar, but yeah, I just wanted to come on today and just kind of give some of my tips that I've had while being an asset manager for the last um, year or so. So uh, I'll just jump right into it. And then if anyone has any questions, just let me know if I can answer anything. Um, so basically I just wanted to go over, I'm sure a lot of you know asset management, but it's just uh, basically monitoring the economic and operating performance of the property that we're currently you're currently working on. It's not to be confused with property management. So asset management is just mostly overseeing the construction of the entire life cycle of the property and um, from acquisition to disposition. And mm -hmm. we're just aiming to just get the goals and objectives for both the owner and the investors and making sure that during the stabilization period, we're getting, um, we're just going according to the plan versus the property management, which is handling the day-to-day -day operations and uh, working to achieve the goals of the owners. So um, mm -hmm. I consider the property management oh, team. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, sorry, I'm not oh. sure. There's oh, a, no, you're good. Noise or something like that. But um, yeah, so actually just, sorry to, if I may interrupt, like just right there. So just for our audience, so between like property management and asset management. So you mentioned like some of the distinctions. So kind of like focusing on the financial goals of the operator as opposed to, um, let's say, I guess like some of the property level um, goes in that sense, right? I mean, to me, like asset management is a little bit more of also, I mean, besides financial goals, also kind of handling like some of the paperwork around it rather than. Oh yeah, yeah, I was just about to go into that, but the like, yeah. so yeah, the okay. asset manager is mainly, so starting from like the planning perspective during the acquisition process, we're uh, getting all of the inspection reports, the, we're creating the budget, we're speaking with the lender and getting all of those documents, we're ensuring the we're making sure the insurance is in place and then we're also having some sort of takeover plan if we're going to keep the property management group that we have or switch over to a new one we're going to also have to notify the tenants see if there's any open balances or current evictions or outstanding work orders that the previous company had um, those are all really crucial to the takeover where the property manager is we're typically just um transferring over all of the tenant files and making sure that they're collect they're on top of the collections that we have in place um, and then they're handling the day-to-day -day operations and so I would consider the property manager probably your best friend during this process because they're the person that you're going to be having that constant communication with you're going to be I would strongly recommend setting up like a weekly call making sure that by this date you had x y and z completed and then making sure that the turning the turn process is going according to plan. So they're handling the day to day and then you're kind of just overseeing that part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then after the due diligence, uh, during the life cycle and the stabilization of the property, you're just making sure like the main role of the asset manager is to just 
make sure you're evaluating the performance against the pro forma that you've had that you put out to your investors and that you had from your underwriting from the beginning and then making sure that uh, you have the certain amount of units that you were going to turn that month, um, making sure that the construction budget is in line and then seeing how you can be reducing the expenses and uh, increasing the income. That's like the, one of the main key points of being an asset manager. And so uh, I guess I could just jump into some ways that you can reduce expenses and increase the income in the property is one, obviously the rent increases and capturing the loss to lease. Um, and then you can take a look at the utilities. So the rubs program. So that can be, you wanna always look at both sides of the combo. So for income, is there a certain way that you could maybe increase or charge back for water or electricity or something versus the expense side? Is there some sort of way that you could reduce the flow pressure of the air bubbles or replace the faucets or shower heads and implementing utility or green initiative programs? Like there's always both sides of the coin. So you're not always just putting it always on the tenant. Um, that also goes for the contracts on the property. So for income, internet, phone, cable, relook at the contracts that you have in place versus the expense side, maybe your contract's ending with the pest control or landscaping or HVAC. Like there is always a way to just relook at the numbers that you have that were previously on the property and then see how you can reduce those expenses, maybe reaching out to a couple different companies and seeing if there's a way that you can save some extra money on that front too. So looking at both sides is always key. And just, um, Alexander, if I may interject there. So just uh, for like some of our audience, I guess um, if they, some of them may know or not like how the commercial real estate model works, such as, you know, improving, your uh, gross revenue, raising your rents, improving your expenses, and sort of raising your NOI actually translates into property value, right? So that's kind of like the, the main business goal. So it's really, I presume like it's an asset manager, you're really kind of moving the business plan forward. Um, right. From the perspective of uh, like real estate, uh, like operator and syndicator and, and so forth. and. So that's kind of like, it's, it's very important. So you mentioned the RUBS uh, system. So do you want to go into that a bit more? Yeah. So this is just um, when you are going to, let's say, have uh, water and trash that the tenant, that the landlord is paying for. And then maybe you can look at that number and see if you can bill back to the tenant. So you could see how much they're paying per month, per unit. Maybe it's about $15 and then you could just bill them back. That can either be on top of the rent or included into their rent. And that would be a good way to just create another source of income for the property. Because if you multiply maybe you have 100 units and $15 a month times 12, that you're generating a ton of income just by doing that. Um, but that also is bringing me to like the next point is that maybe you want to make sure that whatever util or rubs or anything that you're charging back to the tenants is that you're looking at the surrounding properties within, <clears throat> excuse me, you're looking at the surrounding properties as well. Like maybe you and the property next door are getting the same rent, but you're charging for water, electricity, and trash, and they're only tra charging for trash. They're going to go to the other property. So having a really good understanding of the comps in the area of who's charging what, if that includes different types of fees, like pet fees, parking fees, um, application fees, utilities, like you just wanna make sure that you're not stretching it and you're just really in line with the, the comps in the area. Um, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense actually. And so just the RAPS is really a proration kind of, right? It's just like prorated billing according to like square feet and. I guess like unit size and stuff like that. Is that something you can implement anywhere in any market or is are there any limits to it? Um, it would really just depend on the market and you can put it into multiple, yeah, you can do the rubs on all of your, your properties. It would just, you just wanna make sure that the other properties are maybe doing a similar type, like, like I said. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. 
And um, hmm. yeah, we actually, I know you work with Jason, right? Um, and the, with University Holdings. Uh, so we had him like in person in New York City at like an event for this, uh, for, this uh, for our group. Um, I believe it was 2020. And so he shared like some tips uh, about a property that was in, I think it was in Louisville, Kentucky. And so he had like a very good, like, I think he, he had the rubs system improvement, perhaps he had like a very good improvement of expenses there that was kind of, I felt like kind of like not leaving a stone, what's it called a stone, not turned on <laughs> there was the expression, right? It's kind of, um, is, are there, what are other good uh, ways yeah. to improve expenses? What are other ways to save on expenses? Yeah. Um, I would say like relooking at the contracts, that's a big one. Um, implementing utility or e efficiency programs. So uh, we put aerators on a lot, a lot of the toilets that saved us it's like, a, I forget the number, but we saved a lot of work. Um, and then we also just relooked at the contracts that we had. So. Um, our pest control, we found out. Uh -oh. Can you still hear me? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit interrupted. Sorry yeah. about that. My bad. How about now? Okay. Think Seems we're good. Cool. Okay, let's see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I would say look at the expenses. Um, other things is just how is it operationally being ran? So looking at the management company to is uh, there will need as many leasing people on site. Um, that would be a big factor too, uh, just to see, especially for the previous property management groups, you don't know. We've experienced where we saw a lot of random maintenance fees going out and we asked like, what is this all for? We found out that the landlord was paying himself through that. So just making sure that when you're looking at the T12, you're just kind of looking at those odd expenses of why is this so high? Why was this so high in this month? Maybe um, a pipe burst at this month, or maybe there was a fire here. Like you just want to really get the background before, while you have the property under contract during the due diligence phase of like what is making the property have these such high expenses. So you're able to just kind of cover yourself for when you're moving forward. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so for, I assume like it kind of also depends on like the kind of the door improvement in your uh, property value. I've heard like, I've read like some, sometimes there are like posts on social media where they say, okay, if you have a uh -huh. yeah. lower tax rate, um, I'm sorry, let's, um, uh, yeah, if you have like a lower cap rate, you get like a big- Oh, I'm that over here. <laughs> okay, sorry, just one second. Can you um, unmute? Oh, sorry. Um, if you can unmute, I just muted it. Yes. Sure. Th thanks. Um, yes. Yeah, so kind of having a, a lower cap rate to see if has a, I mean, sort of arithmetically, then you get like a bigger upside in your, um, you know, like more door value for your, for a bigger upside in your property value for the door value improvements call it. It's, it's a little circular, I think the, the logic there, but, but, you know, like there's like this kind of comments and like perspectives of if one should be, when executing a value add, if one should be in A class or C class, uh, and like what's the effect of, you know, those improvements that you make and and so forth. But but what have been like some efficiency like besides rubs and other ways like some things. Yeah, so that, some other ways to like add, yeah for you guys. Mm -hmm. Um, some other ways to just like maybe start thinking outside of the box as well. So. Mm -hmm. Is there maybe an office that's larger or that could be turned into a unit? Um, is there some sort of commercial space on the property that could be, if zoned correctly, turned into something? Um, maybe you could turn a basement or a shed into like storage space that people can start paying monthly on that. Um, or you could have, if you have like a specific amount of garages charging a sort of premium on there. Um, you have washer and dryer hookups, but no washer and dryers. Maybe you could have a contract go out there and see if they could charge the tenants for just renting out those washer and dryers. Uh, you could add vending machines. You could put in a trash valet service. My apartment actually does that. People pay like a certain premium and they just come to your door and pick up 
all of your trash. Um, maybe a lot of things that we've been seeing is covered parking. A lot of people want their cars covered. So that's another way to just add some extra income on that front as well. And then um, I'd say those are some big ones. Um, and then you could just take a look at the amenities. Is there a certain space that you could add a dog, a dog park or a gym or a pool? Um, but just making sure that you're looking at the other comps is key as well. Is it necessary? And is this warranting the rent that you should be receiving? Um, just making sure that you're double checking everything on that front. But those are those are some ways that you can add some value to the property. Mm -hmm. So have you had cases where, let's say, um, if you reduce like certain expenses, you know, it could kind of uh, have like, the opposite effect of, I mean, it kind of like not a, the effect you intended is based on like some of the comps and other properties being run differently. Like what would be an example of, of that? Um, like sometimes, mm -hmm. like let's say you're in maybe not the nicest area, but you think that getting this granite countertop is going to bring you extra rent, but you look at all the other comps in the area and they just have like the standard classic renovation, like that you're saving money just by not putting in all of that money for that. Or let's say, um, I'm trying to think, um, I'd say, oh gosh, sorry. Um, I just blanked out, but just looking at, the different properties to see. I think that the biggest ones are the rubs, the fees, and the expense savers. Hmm. What about, let's say, I believe that property that Jason showed back then, I think there was kind of a, more like a physical change to the water systems. I don't remember what it was. So like, he just replaced yeah. a lot of the aerators for the showers and faucets. So it saved a lot of water yeah. on the property. Yeah, so we... Yeah. We did that for a couple of properties that we have over here in Murfreesboro as well. Saves a ton of money. So what he replaced exactly, Alexander, Alexander sorry? The aerators on the, okay. the faucets and the showers, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, okay, and then what about, so the rent increase? So have you, like, what are some, so other than just renovating the units, improving the units, are there other, like, perhaps tenant experiences and things like that that can help you raise the rents? Um, I would say just making it a community that where people want to live, making it safer, cleaning up the area, maybe inviting or having some sort of community thing that people can gather to. Um, mm -hmm. And then possibly like if you're going to raise the rents on someone that's going, that has been a tenant for a while, maybe just offering, hey, if we raise the rent this much, can we come in and replace your cabinets or install backsplash or so, sort of renovate something so you're not just completely raising the rents on them? I think that that's a great key to that as well. And you yeah. guys are in, um, I know you are in Nashville. And so yeah. there's like, I think you have a property in Arkansas, right? Yes, we do. Yeah. And then also like Louisville, Kentucky and like different kind of different yeah, markets. Louisville, uh, Nashville is where we really want to hit home. Um, and then there's Louisville, Kentucky and Little Rock. We have one there. And mm -hmm. then we also have two or three now in Atlanta, like in the Decatur area. So it's mm -hmm. been exciting. I think that my overall takeaway from all of that is to really find a good property management group, really fine tune the process. I think that the biggest hit to your income is going to be having some sort of vacant unit. And so you really wanna have a standard procedure in place, which is just turning the unit, quote, getting the quotes from the contractors, marketing and leasing the unit, that is key. What um, a good tip that I would suggest is that we like to put together like a sort of asset management kit. So like a lot of the units that we renovate are typically same paint scheme, same light fixtures, vanities, have a sort of kit that you can send out to the uh, property management group or the contractors. That way you're streamlining the process a lot easier, have a certain timeline that you are sticking to, like 
painting takes set amount of days and sheetrocking this and installation of this I have um, just have really good team members in place and then for your property manager property manager you just really want to make sure that they have the marketing in line where are they marketing are they doing facebook ads are they doing apartments.com um, how often are they showing the property just make sure that you're aligned on that front i think that having a constant communication with your property manager is the number one um I think my number one takeaway, especially having dealt with a few issues, if that's that's what I would say. Yeah. So how do you vet? So I'm mean, you, I mean, I guess you mentioned some of the ways. So it's kind of like working at their marketing side for for filling in vacant unit, vacant units. Like that's one thing to to review when vetting property managers. Like what's like what are other good ways basically? Because I know it's challenging to find good ones. To find good property managers, um, I would just have that communication with them, reach out to them, ask them what type of fees they do, what's their turn process, do they have in-house contractors, do they use subcontractors, what's their typical turn time, and something that I've noticed is that a lot of property managers will um, usually provide you with their pro forma on how their property is ran, you could take a look at maybe the websites of which property that they is most similar to the one that you're acquiring, ask them how it's ran, how much does it cost per unit to do it, X, Y, and Z, and then put that into your own underwriting. So you can also get a more accurate depiction on what your analysis is going to look like. Um, that, that's been key. They, they will usually provide you with a pro forma. And then um, like in our Little Rock, our Little Rock property, we actually went through three property management groups because we've just had a lot of different issues with communication and timeline. So we were had too many vacant units and we just needed to make sure that we were constantly on point on that front. And I like there was a time where I was thinking I was going down like once a week just to make sure that everything was in line. So communication and having a standard procedure of timeline and marketing and leasing is um crucial mm -hmm. and so because i know you guys have like different sized uh, properties like which are let's say some are above 100 units but some are let's say below 50 so have mm -hmm. you seen like very big differences in property management in those two categories yes um i would also say this is why uh, economies of scales is great. So if you have miss like in Murfreesboro, we have a 24 unit, but we also have a 93 unit and they are close enough that they are merged and they actually save money on that front. So that's a good way to also save on your expenses. But um, I have seen a difference. I think the 36 unit over in Little Rock gets the least attention just because it's smaller um and there's no not a lot of property managers will live on site there's not leasing people on site maintenance people on site so they're also running different properties and maybe it's not a priority i think that the bigger properties are a lot easier to manage just because the process is a lot easier mm -hmm. and it's also i mean i assume like some of the pms they only you know work within a certain units range right so they kind of some of the really good ones, they perhaps don't even go, um, you know, at some of the smaller properties and so forth. So, um, yeah, right. that's why, yeah. When you're vetting the companies, it's that's mm -hmm. why the first thing you ask is what type of properties do you usually service? And then mm -hmm. having a, an example of something that's very similar to the property that you're going to be using or acquiring so that you can see how do they run that property? Is it doing well? what are they missing on and so on and so forth. But I think that just having that comparison is, is helpful. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys choose Nashville? I mean, it's a very growing market for sure, but what was some of, what were some of the reasons for? Uh, um, for I, I actually moved to Nashville because I wanted to work with Jason and Peely. I'd never been here. I didn't know what market I wanted to be in. I just wanted to, I, they didn't even know I was coming. I just showed up on their doorstep basically. And I said, I will be your analyst. I want to work with you. And they offered me a position and I worked as an analyst for a couple months. And then I wanted to learn more about the asset management side. And now 
I am doing that. And so I will drive to the properties. I'll handle the phone calls with contractors, property managers, and uh, just making sure everything's going according to plan. It's been a learning lesson, but that's why I would highly recommend just having a system in place is it's key. A lot of organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. How do you guys uh, find new properties? Like how, what is your deal search process? I presume, I assume it's off market, I guess, or? Um... No, um, we will have communication with brokers and we, we get on market properties, but we do also have a partner that does, he was strictly like off market properties. He loves doing the direct to seller. So he'll bring a property to us and we'll take a look at it and if it works out partner on that. Um, but we do do a lot of on market properties. We actually have one under contract over here that was on market. And then- When you say on market, um, you just mean like WoopNet, right? Kind of. No, through the broker website. Uh, so it, broker I think, okay. yeah, I think something that would be helpful for someone that wants to be in the acquisitions or looking for properties is just to go on all of the brokerage websites like Marcus Milchap, Kirkland, Newmark, and just sign up for their email marketing for the market that you're in. And you'll start just getting those through your inbox. There's a ton that come through daily. And so just going on there reaching out to the broker, getting the whisper, the whisper price, underwriting the deal, providing feedback, that's gonna get you on the radar of speaking to the broker more often. So then maybe they'll toss you an off-market deal one day, they can see that you're consistent. So just, it's, it's a long game, creating relationships and time, it takes time. So um, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great advice actually, since I know like usually people, say kind of like off market kind of search but it's really it's really a mix right and also in like building up the broker relationships so a question um, a question on the chat is um just one second yeah so um do you also work on acquisitions and depositions and are you an operator or gp or independent asset manager um so i have helped with acquisitions just because I'm so familiar with a lot of the brokers as well. So I'll reach out to them. Um, and if I wanted to be a personal GP, I could, but I want, I would probably just bring it to my partners immediately because this, this job, this multifamily space is a team sport. There's so many different roles. There's so many different things flying around. It's important to just have a really good solid team. Um, and so I would, I, I'd say I work on some acquisitions, but I'm mostly just focusing on the asset management. Um, and then am I an operator or GP? I am a GP on two deals, three, actually three deals now. And then as an, I'm an asset manager for Yerusi Holdings, which is the group that I work with. There's uh, four of us now and we're all based in Nashville and I will just handle the properties from there. But yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a little bit of everything, yeah. Do you guys so besides like speaking to brokers, let's say, do you guys do any like direct to owner campaigns and things like that, or? or yeah, not? we use um different like Reonomy or Moody's or yeah. and be able to. We have yeah. a person. We have a director of acquisitions now, and he's doing a lot of just phone calls, checking out spaces of land or different apartments calling the owners and it's really just a lot of calling the owners we haven't really done so much yeah. mail marketing or anything but if we see a property even on the side of the road we'll find out the owner and we'll call them so um yeah 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 that makes sense no like email like email marketing to some sometimes, of them. sometimes but it's mostly just a phone call Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, do you guys have some questions since I've kind of asked like some of mine, I want to make sure everyone gets covered, you know, if you want to speak up. Um, okay, so a question oh, on the chat. Hmm. If I have a lot of demand, may I find the... I'm sorry, but I'm not uh, understanding. 
uh, such as if you have investors, uh, though, I guess like you have like investor demand and to find sufficient deal flow for them. Is that the question? Um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, I think that's where the question is going uh, in my mind. So, uh, if you have a lot uh, of demand, uh, oh, demand. Okay. Okay, so if we're having a lot of tenants in demand, are we finding enough room for them? Is that kind of what we're going for? Um, I think that having demand for a property is good. It's good to just always have applications and just see um, where you can push the rents. That means that you can push the rents a little bit higher if, if necessary. Um, and then also having economies of scale. So if you have maybe one property that's fully booked up, then maybe you can refer them to your second property. Should be great. I don't know if that helped. <laughs> okay, uh, so another question actually that we have is, so are you finding that cap rates are getting super compressed in your area? So out here in Scottsdale, Arizona, they're down to 3.5 to 4% on multifamily deals and 350K plus per door. I yeah, I mean, we're, I feel like we're finding a, compressed cap rates nationally right now. Um, but I think that focusing on the stabilization cap rate is your number one priority versus, I mean, of course the in go, like the, in, the going in cap rate is important, but also the stabilized property is like, where can you see your property going once you've maybe renovated it, renovated it or improved the operational efficiencies? Would the numbers still work at that point? what does your disposition sale look like, the price look like on year five? Is there something that you could continue to um, improve on that front? So I would just continue analyzing deals. I feel like for every 99, there's maybe one good deal and a lot of people are absolutely overpaying and it is frustrating, but it's just consistency, consistency, consistency. Like I get frustrated all the time, but um, it's out, they're out there. And also you guys, I guess you're, I mean, you're in Tennessee and you know, you have some, I know you, you used to have some Midwest at least before. So presumably like cap rates are a little bit higher, you know, compared to Arizona in the current time. Um, but so like you, are you guys changing? Yeah, are you guys changing anything in how you like in your acquisitions process or? I don't know, even asset management process and so forth. Uh, it's based on, you know, like current, the current economy, like concerns for a recession and so forth, or, or is it pretty much business as usual? Um, I mean, I'd say with the interest rates, it's definitely adjusting the numbers a lot, like the returns. Mm -hmm. So just maybe getting more accustomed to that front, but not so much the going in cap rate. Like I said, I really just focus on the stabilized cap rate and then the exit cap of where I see it going. But um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like that's another question. So when the kind of to your, to your point, right? So when underwriting a deal and thinking about property value in five years after stabilized or more than stabilized, how do you forecast where the cap rates will be at that time? I'm typically underwriting uh, 50 to 100 basis points. So if it's a going in cap rate of 4%, I'm typically exiting at a 4.5 or five, just to be conservative on the numbers. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, that's uh, quite conservative, I would say, right? Compared to um, what yeah. I've told. Um, but then what about like, it's like with some of the cap rate, it's not really cap rate compression. It's, you know, I was hearing about cap rate compression in 2020, but the spread of cap rate interest rate was the highest ever, right? So it's kind yeah. of, but now it's just the spread has really compressed. So it's like, what is the, kind of it's harder to underwrite deals in cash on cash return terms. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that's kind of the challenge and. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys have any other questions? I mean, are you concerned of, you know, like some markets becoming like overheated and things like that or? Um, 
right now I'm just focusing on the markets that we're in. And right now it's not like we're not seeing deal flow. I think it's just staying consistent and continually underwriting and looking at deals and they're out there. It's just, um, yeah, I think it just continue doing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that like, if I had to leave with a couple of tips and, um, for underwriting, I would say have an understanding of the time it takes to really reposition the asset um, and achieve the forecasted rents that you're putting out there. Like if you have hundred units and you're automatically bringing up from 650 to 900, it won't happen overnight and it's not gonna happen to all hundred units. So just making sure that you're accounting for renovations, vacancy, uh, how long it takes to renovate the unit and how long the unit will be on downtime and how long it takes to plan to renovate it. And then also have a realistic and practical CapEx budget for your renovations. Do your due diligence on just where you want that to be done to um, reflect eating at your reserves. A lot of people, a lot of underwriters that I've noticed just don't put in um, accurate CapEx renovations because they think that they can just easily turn the unit by painting this and replacing the cabinets, but you don't know what's underneath. Like if there is some sort of sewer problems, fire damage, like you just never know. So just making sure you're cognizant of your replacement reserves, your CapEx budget. And then um, lastly, is just making sure your projected year one expenses are in line with the growth in the market that you're in. You can't just um, have your rents going up to like 10%. So just making sure you're being conservative on those numbers. Yeah. So like what do you guys, let's say, assume usually for rent growth in your underwriting? Uh, Um, That depends on the market, but probably like two to two to three percent, depending on the market. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And then for CapEx, because you mentioned like it's good being good being conservative or kind of like expect kind of seeing like potentially like unexpected stuff that could turn out once you start, um, you know, like fixing up the units, even if it's only cosmetic. So have you seen like some, I mean, now with inflation, obviously that has increased, right? So have you had like a material effect from, from yeah, the so- CapEx budgets kind of going up and I mean, relative to projected? That's a good point. Yeah. So I would, that's why we receive a couple of quotes, but the cost of materials is definitely up, but not only the cost, but the timing it takes to get the materials has been very frustrating. So that's why you really want to make sure during the stabilization period that you're looking at the accurate timelines. Um, And then in terms of CapEx, yeah, I'd say we're probably accounting for a little bit of inflation, but also we're making sure that we have set reserves in place. So about 250 to 350 per unit on that as well. And then we also have the expense reserves, which is about a quarter of the yearly expenses just to fund the deal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So another question from uh, Bradley. So how are you guys dealing with uh, not pricing your units about the base income of the tenant profiles that, that are right for the property? Are you guys dealing with not pricing units about the base income? I'm sorry, I'm kind of. I don't. I'm not sure. <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to speak up, perhaps, if that's okay? Sure. Mm-hmm. So, like, I've been in property and asset management for a couple of decades and watched this inflationary stuff hit the market hard from time to time. Mm -hmm. And with some other investors, historically, uh, purchased properties that cleaned up and turned around to get a return of and on their investment, they priced themselves out of the affordability for the tenant that is right for the property income wise in other words wages didn't keep up with rent Mm -hmm. and so you run into higher vacancy factors that aren't accounted for how are you guys addressing that well that's why we don't look to just completely raise the rents on firsthand like we're not going from 600 to 900 or 
a thousand to eighteen hundred. Like I don't think that that's something that we're that to be more conservative. That's not something that we're doing. We're looking to how can we increase the income on the property through other amenities or rubs or something, and then reduce the expenses that was previously on the property to get stabilized. Or is there something that we can turn the units to maybe be receiving those rents? So um, we're never just completely kicking people out and evicting them to if they don't pay the full high rent. I think that that's one of the last things that we look at and we're pretty conservative on the rent growth, I, but yeah. I think actually, yeah, if I may add to that, I mean, that's kind of like a variable you control, right? It's not like something, it's not like just the market rent going above, you know, wage growth or like market rent growth being above wage growth, you sort of have control within your own property. So it's really, I wouldn't see this as super high risk, you know, for, you know, like operators who are cognizant and so forth. Yeah, um, also, with the people, also with the vacancies, like if some tenant is moving out, and you raise the rents after you've renovated it, then you're not, it's someone that's able to come in there and they're choosing to come and pay whatever that rent is. They're more aware of that versus just an existing tenant where you're just, hey, we're gonna bring your lease up X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm fully aware of all of that. I thought you guys might've figured out something new for the game. So mm -hmm. basically what I'm reading into this is when you, your acquisition department is looking for, for lack of a better way to put it, undervalued under market so that there's enough room for you guys to go in and basically upgrade them and still have the ability to increase the income without pricing yourself out of the market. Okay. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. okay. Kind of the multifamily fix and flip, only fix and hold model. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. But actually, I think there is, I think it's kind of a good question on the market trend. I'm not sure, Sandra, if you agree as well, but I feel like if we take like some of the Western markets like Phoenix, where rent market trend has really exploded like over 20% um, year over year or whatever. So it's like super high. Now, in that case, your property value increased, so it kind of made a lot of money, but that becomes a consideration for the future, you know, if we have a recession and so forth, with um, then new buyers coming in at those higher property values, continuing like to sort of try to execute like some kind of value add model, but on an asset that's somewhat overpriced and, and sort of like wages not having caught up with with um, rent growth, but respectively in the commercial real estate sp space, really meaning with um, asset values. So. So that kind of could become, it's a little tricky that it could become an issue, but yeah, on a single property basis, you're in, you're in really in control. So. Yeah, it's a, I don't think I have the answer to that because I, I agree with you, honestly. I, I don't know, but. Mm -hmm. Right, um, okay. The answer to that is you end up waiting for those properties to go into receivership. And then you take them over because mm -hmm. somebody didn't structure the deal right when they acquired it. Uh, yeah, then, that could be. Yeah, a lot or, of people, yeah. Or to your earlier point, you just it's just harder work to find now, like which or which, whichever properties have their, you know, their rents below the current market levels, and I mean, it just it, it's always hard. But let's say it could get increasingly hard at, at some point, and. Um, or so you kind of want to find like properties that will have enough room, you know, so that once you raise the rent, you are consistent with, with the surrounding economic environment. I think that was like some of, some of your point. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Mm, okay. So any other, um, any other questions? So like, or Alessandra, are there other topics you wanted to cover on uh, I think so good. Uh, yeah, if anyone wants to yeah. speak to me offline, you can reach out to me, or if you have any other questions, I'm happy to help. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Um, so what is the best way for people to reach to you? Uh, you can email me. I will put it in the chat box. Or you mm -hmm. can add me on LinkedIn. My LinkedIn. 
LinkedIn link. Okay, so that's Alessandra at yarosiholdings.com. I don't have my LinkedIn link right now, but there's my name yeah. and yeah. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so- Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us here today and answering our questions. Um, it was great. And um, thanks to everyone for joining as well. Have a good night. Have a good night. Bye.